Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. There's nothing more exciting than a new rocket concept, a new mission to unknown worlds, or an exciting breakthrough technology. But unfortunately for every proposal, there's almost an equal amount of cancellations with only a small handful making it beyond the drawing board. What's even more frustrating is when these concepts leave paper, have thousands of engineering hours put in, hardware gets built, billions of dollars invested, and then it gets put on the shelf. In this new series called Cancelled, we're gonna take a look at some space programs and concepts that were so close to complete and sometimes even launched before it got cancelled. Some of these are pretty frustrating, but nevertheless, let's get started. Three, two, one. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. This video is one of two where we're going to be focusing on hardware that actually flew before it fizzled. It was built, and then bye-bye. Completed, then canned. You get the idea. So if there's something that wasn't in this particular video, stand by, there's a lot more coming. First up, we have a really weird story. It's the tale of a country who went through all the trouble of engineering, building, and successfully flying an orbital rocket, only to cancel it right as it was proven to work. Hi United Kingdom, I'm talking to you. In 1964, the UK government authorized a proposal submitted by the Royal Aircraft Establishment, RAE, for a rocket capable of putting 144 kilograms into low Earth orbit. Most of the rocket's technology and systems were from the Black Knight rocket, an intermediate range ballistic missile, who was built by the RAE. The Black Arrow was also lovingly called the Lipstick Rocket because, well, look at it. It stood 13 meters tall, two meters wide, and was three stages. The first stage had eight engines that were fueled by RP-1 rocket fuel and hydrogen peroxide for the oxidizer. The second stage had two engines with the same fuel, and the third stage was a single solid rocket motor that was spin stabilized. The rocket launched four times, all out of Launch Area 5B at the Woomera Prohibited Area in Australia. And strangely, the spent boosters would land in remote areas of land and not splash down. Kind of like how Russia and China let their spent boosters fall all willy-nilly, potentially landing near people. Only this area is far more remote than Kazakhstan or China. The first launch on June 28th, 1969 was a failure. The second suborbital test was successful. The third test was a failure to get into orbit, but the fourth mission on October 28th, 1971 was successful, putting the Prospero satellite into orbit. In 1971, only a few months before the fourth launch was scheduled, the program was canceled due to budgetary constraints and the fact that the American-made Scout rocket was cheaper, so they could just purchase those instead. There was also an offer from NASA to launch payloads for free, however, that was withdrawn once the Black Arrow was canceled. Whoops. There was one more Black Arrow that was actually completed and built, but never flown, and now sits in the Science Museum London, along with a spare Prospero satellite. There's also the remains of the first stage of a flown rocket, on display in a town of 10 people in the William Creek Memorial Park in Australia. I really want to go see that. So that's the story of the only country to date to develop an orbital class launch capability and then abandon it. Ah, this space shuttle. One of the most iconic rockets of all time. Look at that thing. It's just gorgeous. And despite not quite living up to its promise of bringing down the cost of spaceflight, it sure did have some unmatched capabilities, such as repairing satellites, or maybe even more impressive, it could bring satellites back down from space. As a matter of fact, that military potential was so groundbreaking, the Soviet Union decided they needed a space shuttle as well. So, welcome the Buran, a more powerful, more capable version of the United States' space shuttle. And before we go any further, I've had people tell me I think it's pronounced Buran, so I'm gonna say that, but it might be Buran, I don't know. The Buran might look an awful lot like the space shuttle, but despite its looks, it was to perform the work in quite a different manner. The Soviet Union strapped the Buran to the side of the third most powerful rocket ever, the twice-flown Energia rocket. And again, I have no idea if it's Energia or Energia. That one. Construction of the Buran orbiters began in 1980, 
and the first full-scale orbiter saw the light of day in 1984. The striking resemblance to the United States' space shuttle is of course no coincidence, but it's not just some knockoff. Physics pretty well dictates the shape of vehicles, and the Soviet Union pretty quickly realized the US did their homework and followed suit. But despite the looks, they still had quite the engineering challenge ahead of them. They developed a fully autonomous system that could perform the entire flight and landing all by itself. They of course had to develop their own fuel cells, their own control systems, and then they strapped it to their massive Energia rocket, which was a mighty and super powerful beast. This meant the Soviets had developed a more flexible system by making the Energia capable of other payloads and not just the Buran. Not only that, but the Buran was also eventually to be capable of some powered flight in the air, thanks to up to four jet engines at the aft end of the vehicle. Although it wasn't used on its orbital flight, they wanted to try to have two jet engines on the back for orbital missions, but that never quite panned out. This could have potentially offered some flexibility when trying to land. Unlike the space shuttle, which is completely a glider, it only had one shot at landing. Wherever you're pointing is pretty much where the thing's gonna land. The only orbital flight of the Buran, OK-1K1, took place 30 years ago on November 15th, 1988 at 3 UTC. It went off flawlessly, putting the Buran into space, boosting itself into a slightly higher orbit, and then returning to Earth after just two orbits. The Buran came back and had a perfect runway landing. And again, it did this 100% autonomously. Once it landed, it really looked quite fantastic. It only lost eight of its 38,000 thermal tiles, which is quite a big contrast to the United States' first space shuttle mission, which lost 16 tiles and had 148 of them really damaged. The Buran was supposed to fly again five years later, but with the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, the program went on ice and the Buran orbiter would never fly again. And to add insult to injury, on May 12, 2002, the only flown Buran was wrecked when the hangar storing it completely collapsed because of poor maintenance. The collapse tragically killed eight people as well, and also completely destroyed the OK-1K1 orbiter. Today, there's still two derelict Burans wasting away in a really rusty hangar in Kazakhstan. A few adventure seekers have actually snuck in to photograph them. There's also the OK GLI glider prototype, which is on display at the Spire Technik Museum in Germany. This is kind of like the glider prototype cousin to the space shuttle Enterprise. And lastly, there's a test article Buran, the OKM, that's on display at the Baikonur Cosmodrome History Museum. <sighs> Again, I really want to go see this. And that's the story of Russia's one and only flight of a reusable spacecraft. Now back to the rocket that launched the Buran, the Energia. This thing was extremely impressive and definitely deserves its own segment here in this video. The Energia was a super heavy lift rocket coming in just after the Saturn V and thrust. And despite only having 75% the sea level thrust of the N1, it actually could loft more payload to low earth orbit. It was only a two stage vehicle. And although it might look like the stack of the space shuttle minus the orbiter, it operates very, very differently. The Energia began development after the Soviet Union canceled the N1 rocket, which we'll talk about more in another video about alternate space history. Now, since the Energia was the vehicle that was putting the Buran into space, it carried its payloads on its side, which is super weird. It even did that when it wasn't carrying the Buran into space. I think the coolest thing about the Energia is those side engines on the booster. Now, those are four liquid boosters as opposed to two solid rocket boosters like on the space shuttle, but these side boosters have the RD-170. The RD-170 is the most powerful liquid fuel rocket engine ever. It ran on RP-1 and LOX. That's right, move over F-1 engine. The RD-170 is actually the most powerful engine, but there is a small caveat. Instead of a single giant combustion chamber like the F-1, the RD-170 had four combustion chambers and a single turbo pump. Technically, the industry defines the rocket engine as the power pack or the turbo pump, which feed the combustion chamber. The RD-170 has a single turbo pump, so although it may look like four engines, it's actually considered a single engine. The reason they split up a single engine into four combustion chambers is because the Soviets hadn't figured out how to solve the combustion instability. That's a problem with large combustion chambers. So they fed a single turbo pump into four combustion chambers. Brilliant. 
Then we have the center core stage with four RD0120 engines that ran on liquid hydrogen and LOX. The RD0120 is almost like the Soviet's equivalent of the RS-25 space shuttle main engine. And despite almost exactly matching all the specs to the RS-25, the RD0120 was a lot more simple and also was not recovered since they weren't attached to the orbiter. The Energia wound up flying twice. The first mission of the Energia went, well, pretty well, at least for the Energia itself, which performed fantastic. However, its payload, the Polyus spacecraft, wound up deorbiting. This is one of those funny missions that'll be part of my biggest face palms of spaceflight history, so I won't go into detail now, but basically, instead of putting itself into orbit, it deorbited itself. The Energia wound up launching one more time with the Buran spacecraft, as mentioned, and performed literally flawlessly. The Energia also fell to the same fate as the Buran, being canceled as the Soviet Union fell. It's truly a shame that such an amazing, powerful, and capable rocket never flew again. Despite talks of it being resurrected many times, it never seems to make its way beyond the drawing board. Recognize this? Yep, that sure is pretty much the solid rocket booster off of a space shuttle. So wait, what's it doing out there on the pad all by itself? Well, you my friends are looking at one of the strangest and most dangerous rockets ever considered for human spaceflight. In 2004, President Bush announced the Constellation program, which proposed taking humans back to the moon on a massive rocket called the Ares 5, which is sort of now the SLS, but kind of different. The Constellation program also intended to provide transportation services to the International Space Station to replace the soon retiring space shuttle. NASA was going to address some of the biggest flaws of the space shuttle, like crew safety and the cost of flying cargo on a crew rated vehicle. They saw a simple and cheap way to get crew up to the ISS, and thus the Ares 1 was born. The Ares 1 would loft an Orion multi purpose crew vehicle on top of a single solid rocket booster and a liquid powered upper stage. By 2007, things were looking good with NASA completing its system requirements review, a first for the agency since the space shuttle in the 1970s. Although they intended to use mostly space shuttle derived hardware, a lot of work went into the design of the rocket and pretty quickly, a lot of preliminary plans changed. For instance, due to the massive size of the Orion spacecraft, NASA soon realized they would need a five segment solid rocket booster instead of a four segment booster like the space shuttle had. And despite wanting to pull from the space shuttle, a lot of technology wound up coming off of the Saturn V. For instance, NASA was originally going to use a separate hydrogen and oxygen tank inside the upper stage, just like the external fuel tank of the space shuttle. But instead they had to use a common bulkhead like the second and third stage of the Saturn V. They also wanted to try to use the space shuttle main engine, the RS-25s for an upper stage, but they soon realized it'd be more expensive and it would require a ton of heavy modifications to make it air startable. And air startable isn't necessarily like sea level or vacuum, it's talking about starting mid-flight. So they went with a Saturn V era J2 engine, <laughs> but that too required so many modifications to increase the thrust, they wound up with a clean sheet design known as the J2X. Okay, so put all this together, and we end up with a review in 2008 that wasn't so good. <laughs> it was revealed that there were such great concerns over massive vibrations during the first few minutes of ascent that NASA admitted the problem was a four out of five on their risk scale. So they had to design a solution that would dampen the vibrations. They stuck an active tuned mass absorber, otherwise known as a giant spring, inside the rocket to absorb the vibrations. But that wouldn't be all the bad news the Ares 1 program would receive. Perhaps the biggest blow was a 2009 study by the Air Force's 45th Space Wing that determined if the crew had to abort between 30 to 60 seconds after launch, they would have a 0% chance of survivability. When a solid rocket booster is detonated, the solid propellant fragments would easily melt the parachutes of an aborted crew capsule, and it would fall back to Earth. Okay, okay, but fast forward a few months later, and finally, the first NASA-developed rocket since they rolled out the space shuttle in 1981 hit the launch pad. This was the Ares 1X, a test vehicle designed primarily to test the first stage's performance and verify the controls and dynamics of the Ares 1. It was a bit of a hodgepodge rocket with avionics from an Atlas V, a four segment booster from a shuttle with a dummy 
fifth segment, as well as a dummy upper stage, Orion capsule, and crew escape tower. It also had the roll control system off a Peacekeeper missile. The rocket successfully launched on October 28th, 2009, and the flight lasted only six minutes from liftoff to splashdown. After two minutes of powered ascent, the first and second stage separated and the booster began to deploy its parachutes, just like the space shuttle's boosters did. That single launch cost approximately $445 million, and that was the only time an Ares rocket took flight. Because of the cost overruns, delays in schedules, unforeseen engineering and technical difficulties, and an ever-inflating budget, the Ares-1 program was canceled along with the rest of the Constellation program on February 1st, 2010. In 2011, NASA's then acting administrator Charles Bolden testified that the Ares-1 and the Orion capsule program would have cost four to $4.5 billion a year, plus $1.6 billion per flight. It's because of this, NASA ended up moving towards the commercial crew program that would hopefully bring the cost of launches down. But it's almost 2019 and we have yet to put an astronaut on any of these commercial providers to space. Mostly because the commercial crew program has been underfunded for quite some time now. That's going to end up leaving the US with about an eight year gap in human spaceflight. <laughs> but we're finally almost there. That being said, I'm really glad the Ares 1 was canned, <laughs> considering how much money is already costing us, how much money it would have cost per launch, and also how dangerous it was for humans. I think we made the right choice. This all just makes you realize how important it is to have a clear goal, a healthy budget, and strong leadership to really make big things happen. It makes me really thankful for what we have been able to accomplish but it also makes me kind of frustrated to know what could have been. Now, before leaving me comments on things I forgot, don't you forget there's a few more of these videos coming out with slightly different angles to each one, and even another one coming out with this exact same developed and then dropped theme. So stay tuned, there's a lot more coming. But let me know in the comments below what other questions you have about canceled programs, rockets, or just space flight in general. I owe a huge thanks to my Patreon supporters for helping make this and all other everyday astronaut content possible. I owe a super special thanks to all you patrons in our exclusive subreddit and our exclusive Discord channel for helping me script and research. If you want to help contribute, get access to exclusive monthly live streams, and other awesome things, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Thank you. While you're online, be sure and check out my brand new web store. I finally have things like stickers and patches, and even these grid fin not a coasters. Now notice they're not a coaster because they have holes in them, making them not very good coasters, but they are drink elevators and I do promise a drink will be able to stay exactly this high off of any surface you put these on. Uh, but while you're there, also click on the music tab under my store. I finally released all my music on every platform you hopefully have asked for. So Spotify, iTunes music, uh, Google Play, Amazon Music, all that stuff. Uh, you can go to everydayastronaut.com slash music. You can see links to anywhere it's available. My first seven song EP called Maximum Aerodynamic Pressure is live now. Give it a listen if you're studying to be a rocket scientist or you're working on rockets or you're floating around in space, going on road trips or whatever. It's good background instrumental music and thank you so much for checking that out. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to earth for everyday people. Thank you.